Hi there, Michael Burnett, AF7KB, the fast track ham license guy, with impedance, coordinate systems, and phaser diagrams. In this video, we'll go over how to calculate and graph the impedance of a circuit. So let's review impedance basics real quickly. Impedance is the total opposition to current flow in an AC circuit. It is created by the interaction of four values, frequency, capacitive reactance, inductive reactance, and resistance. When we mathematically combine the resistance and reactance in a circuit, we get the impedance, represented in formulas by the letter Z. Now, obviously, this is a more complex calculation than E equals I times R. We can't just add up the ohms. It takes a couple of steps to complete. First, we have to calculate the reactances, which we cover in another video, then use those along with the resistance to calculate the impedance. The resistive component of the total impedance is equal to the ohms of resistance. There's no calculation to do, no matter what the frequency. Simple. There is no such thing as resistive reactance. Resistors aren't reactive. They're a pure impedance. A 50-ohm resistor has 50 ohms of impedance, period. To calculate the total reactance of a circuit containing XL and XC, inductive reactance and capacitive reactance, we subtract the XC from the XL. Now, by the way, even though those X's should be written with subscripts, they almost certainly will not be printed that way on your exam. So that's why I show them as just XL and not X sub L. X equals XL minus XC. It's always subtract XC from XL, never the reverse. All right, on to the last step. This is the formula for Z impedance. Z equals the square root of R squared plus X squared. Impedance equals the square root of the resistance squared plus the reactance squared. Now That's a formula you'll need to know precisely zero times for the extra exam, despite the fact that this section asks you to calculate several impedances. In fact, we're barely even going to touch the calculator in this video. I just mention it so you can understand why this whole section is based on imaginary triangles. With a little basic algebra, we can rewrite that formula as R squared plus X squared equals Z squared. Or, since there's no rule that says we can't change the letters, we could say A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Hmm. It's the good old Pythagorean theorem, eighth grade math. For all the mystery and mathematics that surround the topic, every single impedance calculation, at least for our purposes, comes down to nothing but a what is the length of hypotenuse C problem. As you learned when we covered phase angles, the angle between the base and the hypotenuse equals the number of degrees the current is out of phase with the voltage. So here we have a resistance plotted as a point on the x-axis of our graph. That's x the axis, not x for reactance. I'll get confused. And reactance is plotted on the y-axis. In this example, the reactance is more inductive than capacitive, so we end up with a positive value for reactance. We also end up with a positive phase angle. If the reactance was more capacitive than inductive, we'd plot a negative number on the y-axis, and we'd end up with a triangle like this one. Now That triangle shows a negative phase angle. Those diagrams have a technical name that's used on the extra exam. They're called phasor diagrams. Notice that in both these phasor diagram examples, we're really just identifying one point on a graph, which is the point where the impedance and reactance lines meet. 
We could specify that point in a couple of ways, and it turns out that each different way comes in handy in different situations. That's what the exam is talking about when it asks about rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates. Imagine that point is a destination where you want someone to meet you. You could tell them, Ralphie, you walk east on the X road 400 paces, and then walk north 300 paces, and you'll be there. If you did that, you'd be using what the amateur extra exam calls rectangular coordinates. Specifically, the 400 and the 300 are the rectangular coordinates. Now, if Ralphie and you know all about this sort of thing, you don't need all those words. You could shorten the whole thing down to the coordinates, something like plus 400, comma, plus 300. Another way you could get Ralph to the same destination would be to say, Ralphie, stand right here. Now, turn 36.87 degrees to your left and walk 500 paces and you'll be there. Were you to use that system, Ralph ends up at the exact same spot. But you've used what are called polar coordinates, and the polar coordinates you used were 500 and 36.87 degrees. If you had told old Ralph to turn 36.87 degrees to his right, we'd call that negative 36.87 degrees. If you gave Ralph those directions in math shorthand, you'd just write 500, comma, 36.87 degrees. Ralph would know those were polar coordinates because one of the values is in degrees. If we use polar coordinates, we call that line that forms the hypotenuse, in other words, the impedance line, a vector. Vectors have a magnitude, also known on this exam as an amplitude, represented by the length, and an angle, which is, in this case, the phase angle. Because the exam asks about both rectangular and polar coordinates, it's important to get the distinction, which is really a pretty simple one. Rectangular coordinates specify the points on the x and y axes. Polar coordinates specify the angle and length of the vector, or the hypotenuse. Realize, too, that in practice, no matter which set of coordinates we use, we end up with basically the same picture and the same values for the reactances, the impedance, and the phase angle. Ralph ends up in the same spot. In practice, if we start with a known or a desired impedance and phase angle, we'd use polar coordinates. When we plot polar coordinates, it's handy to use some special polar coordinate graph paper, which looks like this. Now, here's Ralph's destination plotted in polar coordinates of 536.87 degrees. Now, from there, we can calculate what we don't know, which is the resistance and reactance. It's just a matter of throwing a little trigonometry at it to calculate the rest of the triangle. If we know the resistance and reactance, we'd use the rectangular coordinate system. So let's do one of those. We'll use 400 ohms of resistance and 300 ohms of inductive reactance. We start at the zero, zero mark, right in the center. We plot the resistance. We move right on the x-axis in the positive direction to the 400 mark. Then we plot the reactance. We go up 300 on the y-axis. We're headed up because we have inductive reactance. And there's the point that we want right there, 400-300. From there, we can calculate the length of the hypotenuse from 0, 0 to 400, 300, and the phase angle. Again, it's just a matter of throwing some trigonometry at it. Notice, this is the inductive reactance section of the graph. If our overall reactance is inductive, the impedance point has to be in this upper right quadrant. 
This lower right quadrant is the capacitive reactance section of the graph. And this over here, this is the nope, not here section of the graph. Any value on the left side of zero on the x-axis would require a negative resistance value. In other words, it'd be a signal source like a transmitter or a generator. And there aren't any problems like that on the exam, so none of the answers on the exam are going to be over there on the left side. Now, here comes an example of a question in the question pool that asks you to calculate and plot an impedance. Even though there are some simple ways to get to the right answer for half of these in the question pool with no calculation at all, yes, I'll show you how to calculate the most complicated one, and I'll suggest you practice each one to get your skills down, because two possible questions do require some calculations. All right, here's a question. It's uh, question E5C17. Which point on figure E5-2 best represents the impedance of a series circuit consisting of a 300-ohm resistor, a 0.64 microhenry inductor, and an 85 picofarad capacitor at 24.900 megahertz? Now here is figure E5-2, which is used for all of these questions. Only one of these charting questions uses a circuit with both capacitance and inductance, and this is that question. There is a 300 ohm resistor. Great, so we plot a point at 300 on the x-axis. That narrows down our possibilities to points 3, 8, and 1. They're the only ones that are straight up or down from 300. We'll need to calculate both the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance. Now, if that process is a mystery to you, we do have a video on that. So I'm just going to tell you we end up with 75 ohms of capacitive reactance and 100 ohms of inductive reactance. Inductive reactance is a positive value. Capacitive reactance is a negative value. So, what we're going to do really is add up the reactances, but that's going to look like 100 minus 75 to give us plus 25 ohms of total reactance in this circuit. We find the plus 25 point that's straight above the plus 300 point on the x axis, and that is where we find da -da -da -da, point 8. And that's how all those problems are worked. Okay, subscribe to the channel because this video collection is always growing. Go like our Facebook page, visit the FastTrackHam.com website, and thanks for watching. 7 3.